Uh, tonight, we are going to be hearing first from Dr. Sherman Knapp, um, our veterinarian representing the topic of regenerative medicine, followed by Dr. Jonathan Krishner. So let me just uh, share my screen here so that I can introduce each of our speakers. Perfect. Great. So tonight our uh, presentation is on regenerative medicine for musculoskeletal injury. I am so delighted to welcome Dr. Sherman Knapp, uh, who has been a colleague and somebody I have respected my entire profession and especially now. Um, Dr. Knapp uh, had the honor of being named a chapter diplomat in the newly recognized College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation, which I am a member of as well. Uh, he was past president of our college. He is currently researching regenerative medicine, specifically the use of stem cell therapy and platelet-rich plasma for the treatment of sports-related soft tissue injuries, as well as osteoarthritis. Dr. Knapp currently practices orthopedic surgery and sports medicine at Veterinary Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Group, VOSM, where he is the owner and chief of staff. Dr. Knapp is also the president and CEO of Orthobiologic Innovations, where he is actively engaged in the concept and product design and development of orthopedic and arthroscopic devices, instrumentations, medical systems, biologics, regenerative medicine technologies. In 2015, Dr. Knapp established Project GO, Global Orthopedics in Animals. Project GO is a nonprofit foundation dedicated to helping animals and musculoskeletal injuries from working dog government organizations, rescue organizations, wildlife organizations that have significant budget constraints, as well as pet owners with financial hardship. In 2014, Dr. Knapp established the VOSM Academy, educational training programs for veterinarians in the areas of sports medicine, regenerative medicine, rehabilitation therapy, diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound, arthroscopic procedures. Wow. Um, and what I will tell you that is not written on here is Dr. Knapp is also just the warmest and most humble person that you will meet, who is always such a great colleague. I'm delighted to welcome you tonight, uh, Sherman. Dr. Krishner, who I um, actually have heard speak at HSS. We have the pleasure of attending physiatry rounds at HSS. Um, and Dr. John Krishner is uh, really exemplary in his own field on the human side. Dr. Krishner is a board certified specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation, sports medicine and electrodiagnostic medicine. He is also a registered musculoskeletal sonographer and uses ultrasound to both diagnose and treat neuromusculoskeletal conditions, which is really amazing. And hum on the human side, they actually image nerves, which I find fascinating. And I, I hope we get there on the veterinary side. He completed a subspecialty fellowship training in sports medicine and interventional uh, excuse me, in interventional pain management and received the Earl Elkins Award for achieving the highest score in the nation on the PMR board examination. Congratulations, that's amazing. Dr. Krishner's goal is to restore function, reduce pain, and promote an active, healthy lifestyle using conservative measures whenever possible. It's so fascinating to hear that because that is always our goals as well on the veterinary side of sports med and rehab. His current research is in the use of platelet-rich plasma injections to treat tendinopathy. Other research interests include glenohumeral osteoarthritis and the role of PRP and hyaluronans, the efficacy of ultrasound-guided procedures, novel uses for ultrasound in musculoskeletal medicine, evidence-based spine care, among others. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Dr. Kanap. Um, so please, Dr. Knapp, if you'd like to present um, your lecture, and then we will follow that with Dr. Krishner. There we go. And now we're going to share the screen.
There we go. Hopefully you can see me okay. Looks great. Awesome. I was muted, so we wouldn't get very far. Well, we may. You can just <laughs> read slides. So it, first off, thank you so much for having me. This is a, It's an honor. Um, as soon as you asked and I saw who I was lecturing with, I was like, ah, I saw HSS. I saw his name. And, you know, these are our superheroes on the, on the human side that we look up to and we read their literature and we say, are we doing the right thing for dogs and for horses and for cats? And, uh, you know, we'll talk about acknowledgments here at the end of mine, but I, I have a lot of those HSS guys on my acknowledgement slide from way, way back. So I, I can't tell you how sort of instrumental they've been in my training. You know, it's, it's, we always look to them, what are they doing for this football player, or this soccer player? And that's kind of where this, this talk goes is um, how can we learn what we see in human medicine applied to dogs and vice versa, the things we're doing in dogs um, that they can take away in humans. And, uh, and so I think there's such a great translational approach to medicine in general um, that this is exciting. So I, I'm, I'm excited to kind of share, this is kind of our area, these tendinopathies that's, um, We'll talk here in a second about what they are, but I think most watching this tonight um, or today or wherever you are in the, in the world are familiar with these, but um, we'll just dive right in. But I can't thank you enough for, uh, for allowing me to join this fantastic conference. All right, disclosures. Um, I'm a consultant for pretty much everyone. Um, so uh, this is just a list of companies, human and veterinary. Again, my translational company will take things from vet to human and human to vet and um, consultant for many of these, um, help develop products and, and devices and so forth. So I think we're all aware of how common soft tissue injuries are. It drives me a little crazy when I see a referral come in and the term is soft tissue injury. Um, that's, that's kind of a buzzword that makes me squirm a little bit. I think we can do a lot better now in veterinary medicine and identify specifically what it is of the soft tissue um, that we're trying to treat. But regard, regardless, tendinopathies are so, so common. Um, whether you're a horse, whether you're a dog, whether you're a human playing athletics um, or some sort of sport, um, that repetitive activity can start to lead to these types of tendinopathies. And they're frustrating. These are some things that we, we see on a common basis. Um, the problem is treatments can be challenging. Um, even the diagnosis can be challenging in some situations. And the treatment can be frustrating because recurrences is not uncommon for these. So when it comes to tendon injury, I think we're pretty much all familiar with the, the grading scale, the grade one, two, and threes. Grade ones, um, you're looking at usually a medical management, non steroidals ice, maybe your photobiomodulation, with a little bit of rest. And typically those are going to resolve quite nicely. The grade threes, these are the more severe. These are something where you're looking at more disruption, maybe a complete catastrophic failure where there's a complete tear. Um, and this is usually gonna rely on some sort of surgical intervention, possibly biologics to augment, and then maybe a um, orthopedic device, orthotic, um, in addition to your, your rehabilitation therapy. So it's these grade twos. The grade twos are really what plague us. Um, and from what I've, I've gained working with colleagues on the human side and in the literature, especially ours in the veterinary side, these are the challenging ones. Because what happens is they don't respond to conservative medical management and they're not complete terror. So it's not something that we're looking at for surgical management. And if we try to just conservatively treat these, we get a dysfunctional repair response. You get scar tissue, you start getting fatty infiltration, and these tendons biomechanically are weak, okay? So they start creating further micro tears, and that cycle just continues. And so the question is, what do we do with these grade twos? And they're frustrating on the human side and equally frustrating in canine medicine. Well, if ever there's a place for orthobiologics, I truly believe this is the place, is these grade two tendinopathies. So what's an orthobiologic? I, I think most of you watching this are probably aware, but just as a, a quick review, it's a naturally occurring growth factor anti-inflammatory mediators. It accelerates tissue healing and recovery while decreasing pain by increasing things such as angiogenesis, matrix synthesis, remodeling cell recruitment, alteration in inflammatory mediators. And a recent paper um, from a really good friend and colleague, Dr. Carr, who's a um, shoulder specialist trained um, at HSS, um, had this publication that came out. We'll be quoting this fairly um, often this evening, but this came out of the journal of uh, shoulder and elbow surgery. And he said, these orthobiologics are ideal for musculoskeletal injuries. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on. Now, when we talk about the different biologics, there's many that, at least in our veterinary sector, we can still reach for, okay? And those range from rich plasma, SVF, um, cultured, whether using bone marrow derived or adipose derived, um, aspirate, what's called BMAC, and then combination therapy. And this is something that we'll talk a little bit about as well in some of the limitations of what the FDA allows and, and does not allow. 
So one of the challenges that I've realized both from lecturing at human and veterinary conferences and from the literature is that we are really, really challenged with what's called standardization. In other words, we need to make sure that if we can have a conference like this, where we have human medicine and veterinary medicine, that we're all speaking the same language. And unfortunately, even within veterinary medicine, many a times we're not speaking the same language. So when it comes to the standardization, what we're talking about is terminology, the formulations, the product validation. Is it validated for people? Is it validated for dogs? But does that mean it's validated for horses or for canaries or for cats? Um, we need to make sure that indications when do we inject? Do we inject at the time of the injury? Do we let some time pass in prehab, rehab, and then inject? How often do we inject? What's the time uh, span between those? The volume, um, injection methods, which we'll talk about, which are absolutely critical, um, post-injection protocols, follow-up. How are we going to follow these patients up and then objectively measure our outcomes to make sure that it's working? Another thing that I think is important is that we understand the word regenerative versus reparative. Um, we all like the word regenerative medicine, but are we truly regenerating these tissues or are we giving the body a chance to actually heal itself? So are we using a biologic that's gonna help? I usually say it's like the, uh, the conductor of the orchestra. It's just gonna help orchestrate the recovery process or the healing process, okay? So I like the word more reparative medicine than regenerative medicine. So let's start with the basics. We're gonna talk just first about platelet-rich plasma. For those of us in the veterinary space, this is something where most commonly, um, you know, if we're dipping our big toe into the, into the pond and we're saying, I wanna get into biologics, orthobiologics, but I'm not sure where to start, PRP usually is somewhere, at least in our vet space, that we see many people um, start with. So PRP, and this is something where, um, if you go into the literature, there's so, so much information. And I know um, we're gonna be covering this here shortly in the, in the next lecture, but just briefly, stimulating chemotaxis, increasing cell proliferation, near vascularization or bringing blood supply in, um, inflammatory cell uh, infiltration. As you see here, there's something that, where I used to believe, you know, it's not a signaling cascade, right? We don't have a GPS on this, but this was an injury, this is from Toby, and they applied um, PRP to this location. And what you're actually seeing here in this circle is migration of MSCs or parasites, mesenchymal cells, stem cells, to the location of injury. So there is a self-signaling cascade that's occurring within this type of uh, modulation of, uh, of healing. So when it comes to the different types of PRP systems, there are so many. There's ones that you can use for centrifuges, there's gravity filtration. But at the end of the day, one important factor is, is it leukocyte rich or is it leukocyte poor? And I think that's gonna be important for when we start to talk about different tissue types and different doses as far as treatment. So we published a paper a few years back um, looking at all the various different systems that are out there um, for canines. This wasn't all inclusive, um, but there were many that we had that were commonly used. And you can see quite a difference in variation between pre and post spins just here for platelet concentration, reds and neutrophils. And when we look closely, what do we really wanna see Classically, somewhere around that three to seven fold concentration of, of platelets. The red blood cells, we really do want to pull red blood cells out to the best of our ability. Lymphs and monos, at least in our, our feelings on the veterinary side, they seem to be okay. Um, almost, almost a degree of stemness, if you would. Neutrophils, we're not sure, but many a times, if you think of the veterinary space, if we have you know, a septic arthritis, we have degerm neutrophils. If we have ehrlichia, anaplasm, autoimmune disease, you have non degerm neutrophils. So in my mind, I really don't see a good application for where I wanna put neutrophils in a, a joint or within a tendon. So at least so far from our literature, we're trying to pull neutrophils out of the sample if we can. But I think there's so, so much that we're learning. Really right now, this is a, a paper that was looked at as far as tendon repair, and there's definitely a sweet spot. And we find that too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And just in this graph below, you can see there's a certain concentration where you see wound breaking strength. In other words, you start to increase in concentration and you get to a certain level where all of a sudden, if you increase that below or above that, that number, you're going to start to have detrimental effects on the tissues. Okay, So we have to be careful that we don't overdo it as far as our concentrations are concerned. So what I wanted to do briefly is to try to look at a translational effect or approach to what we've taken from veterinary to human and human to veterinary. So in other words, where I looking, when we're looking for our patients, we say, okay, what were they using in humans um, for PRP or for these other types of biologics that we can apply to dogs or maybe horses to dogs or maybe animals to humans? This is how I broke it down in my mind is 
what's the condition? You know, is there some common characteristics between the rotator cuff in a person and what we see in a dog with Achilles tendons? Was it a soccer player, a football player? Is it something we see in fly ball or agility? Can we correlate the condition in the populations? The formulation, let's speak the same language, back to the standardization, what are we injecting? Okay, leukocyte rich, leukocyte poor, what was the cell counts? Um, injection techniques, okay? You have to get the injection to the location where the pathology is. You can't inject the region and hope that the cells or the biology is gonna make it to the, the area of pathology. So the injection technique is absolutely critical. Frequency, we're gonna look at that, post-injection and outcome measures. How do we know what works works? Not everything works. And this is why it's really important that we objectively look at our outcomes and say, hey, was it a dose? Was it a frequency? Or is this biologic just not going to work for this particular condition or in this species? So let's break it down. We're just going to start with grade two tendinopathies in the canine, looking at platelet-rich plasma. Now, this is a paper published a few years ago by Wendy Balzer. Um, she's also an ACBSMR surgeon as well. Um, great, great specialist. And she published this paper looking at dogs with supraspinatus tendinopathies, extremely common tendon injury or tendon condition in dogs. This was an eight-time increase in platelet concentration with a four-time increase in white blood cells. The injection was ultrasound guided. Again, that's critical. We got to make sure that we're getting the product to the location of injury. Frequency, it was a single injection. Post-injection, she didn't go into a lot of details on the rehab program, but we know, knowing Wendy and her group, they had a very, very, I'm sure, formalized, uh, dedicated rehab program. Now, what they found was, um, let me just minimize this here one second so I can see my slide, sorry. Oops, go backwards again, sorry. Oops, it's not gonna let me go backwards. It just went to equine. That's okay, I'm trying to minimize this so that it's not taking up my, there we go. So, sorry guys. So what it found, <laughs> I went to equine, is that um, is that essentially, and it's going through into the equine one, but in the canine, what they found was that they did see subjective improvement in lameness in those dogs. They did see improvement on ultrasound, but what they did not see was objective improvement in these dogs um, when they use objective outcome measures. Um, there we go. So thank you, Elise. So improved subjective lameness, not improved on objective gait analysis, okay? And improvement in the fiber pattern when they did the ultrasound. And when they looked at the validated client surveys, there was a significant improvement as well. All right, how about if we think about PRP for grade two tendinopathies in our equine patients? So this is one superficial digital flexor tendinopathies, extremely, extremely common in horses. And many times you'll see that as the model when they're looking at orthobiologics for tendon injuries in horses. Here the formulation was five time concentration, leukocytes 1.8 times. There was a PRP group, but they also had a saline control. So this is a really nice peer reviewed uh, paper that was a saline control. Ultrasound guidance, once again, into the core lesion single injection, and they did have a standardized exercise program um, following the injection. What they found was that the lameness did significantly decrease, ultrasound had significant improvements in fiber pattern, and 80% of these horses were able to return to performance. All right, how about if we talk about grade two tendinopathies in the humans, which uh, we know is quite common. I myself have grade two tendinopathies of my rotator cuff in my iliocellus. Um, interestingly, so we're gonna look at some meta-analysis um, in the human. This is 2018, so recent journal article. And I'm just gonna quote some of these that we're gonna see in these slides and, and, and that I've highlighted. The body of literature is currently inconclusive regarding the clinical benefits and cost effectiveness of PRP and the treatment of shoulder pathology. Okay, and this is for PRP for shoulders. I'm like, that doesn't make sense because we know PRP has great benefit and what are they talking about? The PRP didn't work in this meta-analysis. And then you, you dig in further and you say, okay, here it is for PRP, Achilles tendons, uh, meta-analysis, once again in humans, 2018, so a recent paper, did not improve the, the analog scales, reduce tendon thickness, or reduce color Doppler compared to saline control. So I was like, wait a minute, once again, meta-analysis for tendinopathy, not showing improvement, does not make sense to me. We dug further, patellar tendinopathy, 2019, American Journal of Sports Medicine, a single injection of LRPRP or LPPRP was no more effective than saline for the improvement of patellar tendinopathy symptoms. So this just doesn't make sense to me because we know that the data we see clinically that this is supported, what's going on? 
finally, foot and ankle meta-analysis in humans, 2018, lack of standardization, there's that issue with standardization again, of PRP preparations and protocols and the predominance of low quality studies, no definitive treatment indications exist. And this seemed baffling to me because we knew looking at the human, uh, the veterinary literature so far in canines, so, so far in equine, we're seeing benefits. And I know in humans it has benefits. I myself have been injected with PRP. So I was like, this doesn't make sense. And then I thought, wait a minute, is it because these were single injections? And could it be that we need a series? Could it be that some of these conditions, if they're a grade two chronic tendinopathy, that we may need more than one single injection? And so then if you start to dig into the literature, here we have it, 40 competitive athletes with patellar tendinopathy in humans, single PRP injection versus two PRP injections, these were two weeks apart. Again, ultrasound guided, and they went into a standardized PD program. What did they find? Two PRP injections had significantly better clinical scores. Two months after the last injection and out every four months with a two year minimal follow-up. So they followed these human athletes pretty far out, about two years, again, two injections. Here's another paper, 28 athletes, patellar tendinopathy. Okay, this was again, three consecutive injections, one week apart now. The clinical score is significantly improved. 21 of the 28 athletes were able to return to sport. And here they had follow-up MRI, which showed improvement in structural integrity. So again, series of PRP seemed to have the improvement that we weren't seeing with the single injections. So in conclusion, American Journal of Sports Medicine 2019 Multiple PRP injections may offer a more satisfactory result at long-term follow-up and can therefore be considered a suitable option for the treatment of patellar tendinopathy. So I think for these chronic conditions, and it makes sense, we need to do something to jumpstart the body, wake it up, bring in blood supply, upregulate tissues. Um, it seems that more than one may make sense for these chronic types of conditions. So then we think about, well, what about leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor? Well, there's a great meta-analysis also that was out in humans um, that if we look at, they found that the most significant outcomes were using leukocyte-rich PRP. There was no significant difference when they looked at controls and that ultrasound guided and guided techniques was clinically of the most important significant effect, of course, because again, if you don't know exactly where that lesion is within the tendon, you cannot get the PRP to that location and you're not gonna have a good outcome. Therefore, you're going to feel that the treatment doesn't work. The client's going to feel that the treatment doesn't work or patient. And all of a sudden it's going to get a bad rap when in reality is could have worked had you got the injection to the location. All right. So future directions. This is a recent paper that was um, quoted 2019, allogeneic. Okay. So with that, we know there's some degree of variability between patients. If we have allogeneic allows for standardization, um, this can come in a powder formulation, exact composition for the various conditions, we can somehow formulate that. And in this one clinical trial, they show significant improvement in pain and outcome scores for rotator cuff injuries with allogeneic. So just something that I think we need to think about in the future. Again, a lot of work needs to happen first with, with the FDA um, for that to occur. How about stromular vascular refraction? What do we have in the veterinary space, meaning canine and equine, what do we have in the human space for grade two tendinopathies? Well, if we look for stromal vascular refraction, what are we talking about? This is where we go for a fat sample. And in the dog, that can be around the inguinal region, that can be sometime in the flank area. Most of the time, we're gonna go for the falciform because these dogs, especially ones I see that are sporting dogs or working dogs, they have very, very minimal fat. So you're gonna take roughly about 40 grams of fat and you're gonna process this. And we know that you're looking at about 500,000 to 2 million cells per gram one to 10% of these nucleator cells are considered ASCs. And so in 100 grams of adipose tissue, you're looking at roughly 0.5 to 20 million ASCs that can be extracted from your SVF. So if we look at the use of SVF for grade two tendinopathies in humans, what we're gonna be looking at is once again, Achilles tendinopathies, these are human patients. Um, PRP now in 28 of them, SVF in 28 of them. So they did a head-to-head -head comparison of PRP versus SDF, SVF, ultrasound guided, and this was a single injection. And what they found was significant improvement in both groups, but they did have a fast, faster improvement in the stromovascular fraction. MRI and ultrasound also showed improvement in both groups. But for patients requiring the ability to come back to physical activity sooner, it looked like SVF was gonna be something that would be more beneficial. It was repeated here, Achilles tendinopathy, again, in 44 human patients, 23 being PRP, 21 being SVF. So again, a head-to-head -head, uh, comparison, 
both PRP and SVF also showing improvement, MR and ultrasound showing improvement in clinical signs in both groups, but once again, SVF giving us a faster recovery. But I don't know that a faster recovery is better. Again, we have to diagnose the patient, okay? We have to treat them appropriately, and these tissues take time to heal, okay? So a faster recovery, just because it looks better on ultrasound or MRI, doesn't mean that biomechanically these tissues are ready for the biomechanical load, okay? You not just inject them and rehab them, you need to then go into a conditioning strengthening program, then start to retrain them, then get them out. So I think some of the failures, if it's not from the fact that we missed the location or missed the diagnosis, we didn't get the injection where it needed to go, we weren't using appropriate protocols or formulations, did we push them through the program too rapidly, okay? And did we not protect the tissue? So with these papers, even though SVF was more rapid, is that necessarily a good thing? So when we talk about SVF for tendinopathy for equine for canine, it didn't exist. I really wasn't able to, at least to date, to find any papers that existed. So let's move on to quote unquote stem cells. And with this, we're talking about true mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs. So for us to consider something to be an MSC, it has to have the ability to self-replicate, ability to differentiate, to fight apoptosis, plastic adherence, and they work through chemical mediators and cytokines. Now, the challenge that we run into, at least here in the United States, is that this is more than minimal manipulation. So currently, according to the FDA, this is not something that's allowed, at least here, um, clinically, um, for those that are not in a study, that's an FDA-approved study um, for clinical application. When we look at culture-expanded stem cells for grade two tendinopathies in the canine, there was a very nice paper out of CSU years ago. This was a, a, a case report and a border collie that had an Achilles tendon strain. Here they used bone marrow-derived cultured stem cells, ultrasound-guided into the lesion. This was a single injection, and they placed this patient into a custom orthotic that they could dynamize over time. Again, we need to protect those tissues as we're slowly starting to load them over time throughout the recovery process and throughout rehabilitation therapy. What they found in this patient was lameness subjectively resolved. They also looked at it with force plate and there it was improved. Ultrasound examination showed improvement and they followed this patient out long-term 631 days. The owner reported that it was normal and they followed up with force plate and the patient was still sound. If we look at culture expanded stem cells for grade two tendinopathies in the equine, what we have is again, a superficial digital flexor tendinopathy. Here you can see these were bone marrow derived and you see there's a control group. Now what they found was lower structural stiffness, significant improvement on ultrasound, and they looked at these histologically and saw significant improvement at the zoos as well. That was a single injection, again, ultrasound guidance, and they were in a six month exercise program following that injection. How about culture-expanded stem cells for grade two tendinopathies in humans? Well, this is a paper that came out in the journal Stem Cells, 2018, human patients, rotator cuff injuries. And these were cultured adipose-derived uh, stem cells. Here was interesting. They had a low group, a medium group, and a high group as far as the dose was concerned. Ultrasound guided, once again, single injection. This was interesting. Shoulder was immobilized for four weeks using an abductive um, abduction brace followed by PT. So immobilization, again, we, we, we have to protect the tissues. We know that immobilization can cause some issues in itself, but again, this was something in this paper they felt it was very, very beneficial for protecting the tissues. What they found, no adverse reactions um, with the culture cells, significantly decreased shoulder pain. The MRI showed that the uh, defects significantly decreased, and here they looked at arthroscopic examination. So interestingly, if you look at letter C here to the top right, this is the arthroscopic view of the subscap tear before and after. And as we know from dogs that have medial shoulder syndrome, which you know I probably see you know so so many. We uh, we we did a webinar on that most recently. Extremely extremely probably the most common thing I see in shoulders in sporting dogs. Subscapularis tendon is the most common tendinopathy. And what you see here in this pre and post arthroscopy image is really nice fiber pattern and neovascularization to the area of the tendon. How about bone marrow aspirate concentrate or what we call BMAC? So this is something that when you look at preparation administration of BMAC, it does not require the approval of the FDA because here we have minimal manipulation, okay? So we talk about type one versus type two um, homologous use. So this makes it one of the few FDA compliant procedures that can acquire both progenitor cells and growth factors. So 
BMAC. This came out, American Journals of Sports Medicine 2019. And this is really, really interesting. It contains more growth factors and up to three times more nucleated cells than PRP. Considerable concentrations of interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, and it has small populations of MSCs. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we don't think about when we think about bone marrow aspirate concentrate. So in the canine, this is something that we use extremely commonly. Um, we went from culture-expanded adipose-derived tissue to bone marrow aspirate concentrate probably about five years ago because of the fact that we saw the data in humans was very, very substantial. We Something we can perform patient-side, okay? It can be an outpatient procedure. We can take our tissues, collect them, process them, and then inject them single session, okay, under ultrasound-guided, um, fluoroscopic-guided, however we're doing the injection. The challenge is when you do culture expansion, you're collecting the tissues, sending the patient home to Canada, California, wherever they're going, they have to come back two to three weeks later, and then you have to inject. So it's multiple locations, transferring tissues across state lines, and you can lose the tissues, they can freeze in progress, become contaminated. So having patient side techniques, very, very promising. So this is something where you can see here, we're collecting bone marrow. Different technique though, from what you're seeing in this video, very slow pulls, gradually increasing the needle into the location. You want more bone marrow than you want peripheral blood. So it's really, really important that you go ahead, advance your needle slowly, small pulls, low pressure, advance, low pulls, uh, small pressure. Something that we usually do from the, the femur, challenging to get it from the ilium in dogs compared to getting it from the ilium in humans. Um, and the humerus, again, the technique to get it into the human or into the, uh, the humerus can be challenging to get more bone marrow than peripheral blood. So the femur is typically our location. So how about looking at bone marrow aspirate concentrate as far as quantitative analysis in humans? And this is a paper, Translational Journal of Medicine 2019, where they found the cell viability to be 90%, significantly um, enriched TNCs and platelets. And here they compare two systems, a system called M-Site and a system called um, Harvest. And what they found was that it significantly enriched the MSCs, both systems increase growth factors. Neither system concentrated red blood cells. So people are always worried about when you use BMAC or collect bone marrow and process, that you're also concentrating red blood cells. And in this particular paper, they showed that that was not the case. How about quantitative analysis in the canine? Again, we have to make sure we're taking these technologies from human medicine and bringing them to canine dogs are not people, okay? And it, it makes sense. If you think about even just back to PRP, think of the red blood cell, that's the difference between what's in a fish or a camel or a canary or a human or a horse, different sizes. So therefore the G-forces, the speed time, the, the length of the time of spin application for separation, it's all gonna be a little bit different from species to species. So might bone marrow aspirate concentrate, okay, when we're doing those processes. So we have to make sure that it's validated. So just like we published the paper validating it in canines um, back a few years ago, we also went ahead and did an analysis with our friends at University of Maryland School of Biomedical Engineering looking at um, the quantitative analysis of BMAC in the canine. So we went ahead and took randomized dogs. These were skeletally mature, healthy dogs. We processed the BMAC according to the guidelines sent the sample immediately to University of Maryland where they looked at um, colony generation, cell viability, positive expression of CD44, 73, 90, 105, and negative expression of 14, 34, and 45. So what you can see was that this, the live dead assays, the viability was very, very high in the upper 90%. You can see our CD positive markers, our negative markers. And when it came to the final concentration with BMAC, you're looking at about 1.2 million MSCs in that final concentration. When it came to concentration of red blood cells, you actually see here in the graph that you're actually pulling out the red blood cells within the system. You also see that you're increasing platelets. So we are um, increasing our platelet concentration um, in the BMAC as well. So how about if we look at bone marrow aspirate concentrate, again, for grade two tendinopathies in the human? So this is where they're looking at human patients with patellar tendinopathies who actually had failed physical therapy. So it was greater than six months of PT and they had failed. So here they went ahead, they did a BMAC injection, single injection, and then they went back into a PT program. What they found, statistically significant improvement in the scorings, significant improvement in ultrasound grading scores, and the ultrasound showed an accurate, more accurate than MRI, interestingly. So let me get back to that ultrasound showed more accurate than MRI. Again, with ultrasound, we can do dynamic assessments. We can look at the opposite limb compared to the injured limb or the tendon to compare over time. We can also stage them and look serially at 
one week, two week, four week, eight, 12, where you really wouldn't be going back to the MRI at every time point. So there are so many benefits of MSK ultrasound over MRI, and that's our preference here at VOSM as well. So bone marrow aspirate. So lateral epicondylitis, tennis elbow, again, significant improvement in uh, uh, virtual scoring. For the equine bone marrow aspirate concentrate, SVF, again, here they looked at culture cells compared to the BMAC, and they used a saline solution as well. At the end of the day, what did they find? Significant improvements in the animals or the horses that had the injections in the BMCs compared to the ones that were cultured. Okay, and if you look at these significant improvement on MSK ultrasound in both treatment groups compared to control. So combination therapy. All right, so we're going to talk just briefly about combination therapy because in my mind, this is what makes the most sense, okay? There is great synergy between all these different bi biologics that we talked about. Could it be that bringing them together is going to make the most sense and have the best outcome for our patients for at least this particular condition? We know that there's growth factors, there's MSCs, there's a scaffold when we talk about stem cells and PRP, where the growth factors in the cytokines, they bind to the receptors, they initiate and upregulate a cascade of events. We know that you need a scaffold, okay? And we know the PRP can provide that scaffold. And PRP also provides a delivery vehicle and three-dimensional scaffold to support then the stem cell cell engraftment, survival, and proper differentiation. So if we look at combination therapy, BMAC and PRP for grade two tendinopathies in humans, here again, rotator cuffs, 2018 journal article, so recent, they looked at BMAC with PRP compared to a control group, significant improvement in the BMAC PRP and visual analog scales, significant improvement in BMAC PRP using the American shoulder and elbow scoring system, and the ultrasound tear size continued to decrease in the combination group compared to control. Again, 115 shoulders, combination therapy, continued improvement, BMAC PRP injections, substantial systematic improvement functionally, and they followed them at one month and all the way out to two years. For the equine, combination therapy, once again, SDF tendinopathy, BMAC PRP, and what they found, significant improvement in lameness, MSK ultrasound shows significant improvement, and a faster recovery. Now, interestingly, when the PRP had a slightly higher concentration, they found it to have a faster recovery. 84% of these horses were able to return to competition. And finally, the last thing we'll talk about, combination therapy, BMAC PRP for grade two tendinopathies in the canine. Now, this is something where we look for years and years at supraspinatus tendinopathies being so, so common in humans, being extremely common in dogs. And we published this paper on 327 supraspinatus tendinopathies um, back in 2016. Of those cases, 74% failed to respond to medical management. 40% were in a dedicated rehab program and failed to respond and a few had intraarticular injections. So we took those patients that failed to respond and then we treated those with MSCs. And in this particular situation, we use adipose per derived progenitor cells with PRP combination. What we found was that the dogs that we injected the combination therapy has statistically significant improvement on ultrasound and statistically significant improvement in objective gait analysis. 96% of these dogs were able to return to sport. This was a single injection standardized rehab program. All these injections were performed ultrasound guided. So we repeated this looking at now the use of BMAC with PRP. And what we found also was significant improvement. There was a decrease in the size of the lesions on ultrasound. 90% of these had a fiber pattern echogenicity improved by 90 days. So we saw not only do we have improvement with adipose derived culture stem cells with PRP, we saw similar improvement looking at bone marrow with PRP. So in conclusion, I know whew, that was a lot of information, but at the end of the day, Grade two tendinopathies are common. Most of us watching this have a canine, an equine patient that have it, or you're a human yourself that has it, you're an MD treating somebody with a grade two tendinopathy. But through this translational approach, we, I think we have a significant impact on how we treat these. Standardization, standardization, standardization. We need to be speaking the same language, okay? We have to understand what we're injecting, how they're following them out, what type of rehab program we're using, standardization. I mean, the FDA is really, really driving, the, you know, pulling their hair, hair out over this as well. 
MSK ultrasound. You need it for the diagnosis. You need to use it for your injection and to follow the response to treatment. How else do we know if we can continue to progress the patient through the rehab program if we don't have objective visualization of the tendon injury and healing process? Um, what you do after the injection is just as important. Rehab, rehab, rehab. And there's so much we can gain together from working with animals to humans and humans to animals. Acknowledgements. These are it. So, so many of these guys, Victor, HSS, so many of these guys, I learned so much from. I've been invited to, to lecture on their podiums, such as Toby, and I wouldn't be doing what I do without the great knowledge of, of these incredible uh, superstars that you see here uh, on this slide. So I'm extremely humbled to be uh, included in, in some of their meetings, and uh, I can't tell you how much I, I owe to them what we do for our canine athletes here today. Um, any questions, Orthobiologic Innovations, our research development company, Elisa's email is right here. Please feel free to reach out. And if any of you are owners watching this um, that have patients that are your own animal that you can't figure out, or you're a veterinarian, surgeon, rehab therapist, um, sports medicine doctor, and you need some help with the case, you need guidance, um, you need some assistance with the actual procedure. We have telemedicine software that we can actually do the procedure with you, scoping or ultrasound. Feel free to reach out to our virtual uh, platform, CANAP Sports Medicine. And with that, um, thank you so much. Hopefully this was helpful and we look forward to, uh, to your questions after our next lecture. Thank you so much, Sherman. I uh, so such a wealth of information, and I um, was not expecting to hear about dogs and humans in yeah. yours. So that's truly translational. Uh, I want to hand it over to Dr. Krishner now, and then uh, hopefully a little bit of discussion between the two of you. And uh, we'll see. We're we're running short on time, but um, hopefully, if the audience uh, is willing to stay on with us, we can continue to have this excellent conversation. Thank you, Dr. Krishner. Thanks so much, <clears throat> Leilani and uh, Dr. Knapp. That was really a terrific talk, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, just please let me know if you can't hear me or see me okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about an update on orthobiologic treatments for human tendinopathy um, with a focus more on, on PRP. Um, I'm going to review a little bit of, of some of the definitions of tendinopathy, um, trying not to be redundant with what, with, uh, what Dr. Knapp went over, talk about some of the pathophysiology of, of tendinopathy, but specifically tendinosis review some of the interventional treatments um, that we perform for tendinopathy and some of the research I'm doing on something called a percutaneous needle tenotomy or PNT or fenestration, um, and also talk about PRP. Go into a little bit more detail about the mechanisms of action of PRP, and then we'll save time for questions and discussion. So here in the upper right corner, you can see a picture. <clears throat> this is severe tendinosis of the common extensor tendon. So while humans, similar to dogs, often have a lot of supraspinatus tendinopathy, often we're seeing a lot of elbow tendinopathy. So this is a severe tendinosis or a degenerative type of tendinopathy, but you can see there's echogenic material, hypoechoic area here. So that's not torn, but that's severely degenerated. So when we talk about tendinopathy, you know, tendon is, is, is a tendon pathosis problem. So it just means tendon problem. And people often throw these words out sort of willy-nilly, tendinitis, tendinosis. So it's important that we use a standardized nomenclature and try to use standardized treatments as Dr. Knapp was alluding to. So um, tendinopathy just means any tendon problem and that can include tears, but tendinosis is typically degenerative, um, a, a degenerative tendon condition. Tendinitis is a misnomer because we've learned that these aren't really inflammatory conditions. When you do biopsies, you see, um, angiofibroblastic proliferation, basically it's a failed healing response. So the tendon's trying to heal, but it's not doing it appropriately. There's excessive um, fibrotic tissue, and then you get this amorphous sort of scar that doesn't have the structural features to allow for, for true full function and also can be painful. So in humans, lateral elbow is one to 3% of the general population. Achilles um, is 6% of the sedentary population, but in runners, especially elite endurance runners, over 50% have some degree of Achilles tendinopathy. Gluteus medius is something I see very often, and often the older term is trochanteric bursitis, but we've learned that most of our patients don't really have bursitis, they have a tendinosis of the gluteus medius, much more common in women. Um, and this is definitely a New Yorker's disease because we walk a lot here in New York. Um, and so the more you walk often, um, the more lateral hip pain you'll get. Um, so overall Achilles and the glute medius are the more common things we're seeing in the lower limb, lateral elbow uh, followed by supraspinatus are probably the more common things we're seeing in the upper limb. So the typical hallmarks of tendinosis on ultrasound are going to be thickening, hypoechogenicity, so focal areas of darkening of the tendon, and overall heterogeneity of the tendon. So instead of a consistent fibrillar pattern of these parallel hyperechoic lines here, 
you'll see these hypoechoic areas, you'll see this fusiform swelling, you may see partial tears, and then you also may see neovascularity. So this is where ultrasound is really important because it can help us localize not just which tendon is, you know, is it a tendon problem, which tendon is affected, but more specifically, what area of the tendon is affected. Because as we're going to insert needles and biologics into these regions, you want to make sure it's going into the area that needs it. Um, but the neovascularity um, is, is one of the reasons why it's theorized that people have pain. So normally the tendons aren't very well innervated nor vascularized, but as they're injured, you have these new neo vessels growing in sort of from adjacent fat pads. So this is an Achilles, this is Kager's fat pad, which is highly vascularized. And so these new vessels form and they sort of grow into the tendon, they feed the tendon, you would think with nutrients that would help it heal. Unfortunately, it's this disordered healing response Often pain chemicals are being brought to the area that cause pain, and then neo nerves grow and sort of piggyback along the vessels. So now an area that wasn't innervated is innervated, and people can feel pain. Um, this is just a summary of, of that pathophysiology. You have an initial injury that could be, you know, one spe specific acute injury, but typically it's a repetitive sort of chronic injury. There's a failed healing response, and then eventually patients are going to present once they're in the stage three where. Um, you know, often the damage is already done. When it comes to humans, what's been shown to be helpful and what are our different options? So initial treatment is always conservative. I mean, we're rehabilitation specialists first and foremost. So it's modifying activity, looking at footwear, looking at the biomechanics of the kinetic chain. You know, often if someone has an Achilles issue, you want to look at their hips. Maybe there's hip weakness, excessive knee valgus. Um, so looking at any modifications you can make, you know, to their activity, orthotics, et cetera. Um, and then when they fail, modification of activity or physical therapy, then we start looking at different pharmacologic or um, interventional treatments. Um, percutaneous needle tenotomy, I'm going to talk about more later, but basically we're taking a needle, we're poking holes in the tendon to try to break up scar tissue, stimulate blood flow. The idea is that the body doesn't help chronic injuries, but by creating an acute injury, it's stimulating local tissue factors and cells to come to the area to heal it. Hydro scraping or high volume image guided injection is helpful for patients like I showed you before. So in this case, when you've got these neo vessels, you basically place a needle under the tendon and you inject high volumes of saline to mechanically break or disrupt the neo vessels and nerves from entering the tendon. That's similar um, to the procedure by Alfredson where surgically he debreeds um, the tendon. So we're doing that percutaneously without surgery. Um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy has been shown in some studies to be helpful. We won't really talk about that here. Um, steroid injections are really not recommended for chronic tendinosis. They're used certainly, uh, you know, I'm sure for the veterinarians you use them in animals as well, but we try to avoid it in humans. The research really doesn't show that there's any long-term benefit from steroids and the steroids can impair healing and be um, deleterious in the long term. So when it comes to the biologic treatments, we're looking at PRP, the um, mesenchymal stem cells, which could be bone marrow adipose derived, um, alpha-2 macroglobulin, autologous tenocyte implementation, um, aren't really commonly done, so we're not going to talk about that. So what we're trying to do is really replicate this natural healing cascade, and I always show this slide when I give these sort of talks because you want to think about how long it takes for an injury to heal, and I also show this slide to patients, or I at least describe it to them, so they get an understanding or an expectation of when we expect them to get better. You know, so often we do an injection, we expect people, or maybe the patients expect to get better in a couple of days or a week, but you can see full healing can really take, you know, over a year um, but initially when you have an acute injury, there's acute inflammation, you then lay down granulation tissue um, in that sort of fight or flight mode. I think about, you know, being bit by a tiger and you're bleeding everywhere, you just need to stop the bleeding. And then later you lay down fibroblasts, you remodel that scar and try to heal it better. Um, so this is what we're trying to do with our biologic treatments, but you know, hopefully we're trying to shorten, not necessarily cheat the steps, but, but shorten this curve and accelerate the process. Okay, so when it comes, you know, to regenerative medicine, Dr. Knapp pointed out, you know, it's not just one thing. Um, the analogy is if you want to grow a plant, you need soil, you need water, air, sunlight. So you want to create a, you know, a nice hospitable environment for patients to heal. So when it comes to the growth factors, you can think about that as the fertilizer. And those are things like TGF-beta, PDGF, VEGF. Those are the sorts of things that are found in PRP. We've got our scaffolds and that's the substrate for this stuff to stick to. And that could be the local tissue or that can be things that we add like hydrogels, fat, fibrin, or um, you know, local extracellular matrix. And then cellular factors, which also could be local factors that we're just stimulating through a parakin response 
or other cells that we're putting into the area, whether they're MSCs, HSCs, or hematopoietic derived stem cells, VSELs, um, or CD34 positive stem cells, which have been shown in PRP. But of course, you need that hospitable environment. So I don't know if dogs smoke. We always tell our patients, don't smoke. Um, you know, make sure you're a healthy weight. The, the healthier you are, the better you're going to do with these treatments. A lot of what we can do in humans is really limited by the FDA, and that's why the focus of my talk is going to be on PRP, because really that's where the best evidence is. Dr. Knapp presented some of the human studies for some of the other products, but there aren't really a lot of great randomized controlled trials on some of the other things. So we're allowed to use autologous stem cells. We can add autologous blood products. We can use PRP. We can basically take a tissue sample and, and centrifuge it to extract cells, but we can't mix cells, sort cells, remove them from the office or from the clinic. We can't expand them. And SVF is no longer allowed because we can't add enzymes like collagenase to try to dissolve the fat and aid in harvest. Amniotic tissues used to be allowed. They're no longer allowed. Okay, so go into a little more detail about PRP. Um, you know, the goal again is to help injuries heal better, not just minimize symptoms. Platelets release a lot of bioactive proteins, and these are responsible for attracting macrophages, MSCs, and osteoblasts. They also help to remove necrotic tissue and enhance the local tissue regeneration and healing. So they help to debride the bad stuff while hopefully promoting uh, the good stuff. Platelets contain different granules, and it's these alpha granules that contain the clotting and the growth factors that are released to help with healing. So this includes adhesive proteins so that platelets can aggregate and stick together, but also attract other cellular factors to stick to the area of injury. Um, clotting factors, there's fibrinoly fibrinolytic factors, proteases, growth factors, cytokines, antimicrobial proteins, and then different membrane glycoproteins. So the platelets reach a site of injury they're activated by thrombin. They then change their straight, uh, their shape. They develop arms, they stick to each other, then they attract more platelets. And then they degranulate and they release all these, um, these growth factors. Now, interestingly, things that may affect this degranulation, 5-HT is serotonin. So some practitioners tell patients to stop their SSRIs. Those are antidepressants. So as much as I wanna help patients pain, I don't wanna take them off their antidepressants. That may make their pain worse. Other things um, that affect this degranulation um, ADP, so things like Plavix and other anti-platelet um, agents may impair that, and NSAIDs. Um, so you don't want patients on NSAIDs when you're doing PRP. These are some of the growth factors. For the sake of time, you know, I'm going to go kind of skip this slide, but you can look up these further. Um, so the things that you want to think about, you know, how come when you look at the literature you see such variable results? Um, you know, clinically often we get good results, but the literature doesn't always you know, add up to that. So, you know, there's a lot of variability in how people do PRP. And as you're reading up on it or learning how to do this, if you're not already doing it and you're talking to experts like Dr. Knapp, you know, you want to know kind of the nuance and the detail, which patients are they choosing? Are there ways to pick, you know, which patients are going to respond better or not to these treatments? What condition are you treating? What's the best dose of PRP? What's the best way to prepare it? Do you want to include white blood cells or not? How many treatments do you want to do? And of course, being rehab doctors, what's the best post-procedure rehabilitation? Um, so one of my colleagues in Texas, Dr. Jerem, he looked at NSAIDs and he actually found that for patients that were taking a low dose aspirin, they had reduced expression of TGF beta, PDGF, VEGF. So even a low dose aspirin can affect this. So for patients that need it for cardiac purposes, you know, I don't stop it. A lot of patients take 81 milligrams of aspirin for primary prevention and it hasn't really been shown to be effective for that. So if that's why they're taking it, I usually will stop their aspirin with the permission of their primary care doctor. Um, Manava looked at naproxen and also found that it inhibited several biologic factors, but a one-week washout period was sufficient for recovery. So I tend to tell patients to hold off on NSAIDs for a week before the procedure and for a month afterward. Um, some, you know, I use ultrasound to do all these procedures, but some practitioners use fluoroscopy and they use iodine-based um, contrast agents. Those have not been shown to affect PRP. So if you're injecting intervertebral discs, for example, you need to use a little bit of contrast. That's probably not going to affect the PRP. Um, as far as clinical evidence, this was the big, large, classic study done by Mishra that showed that um, PRP was effective for tennis elbow, and that's been extrapolated to other tendons as well. Um, but in this study, um, at the final follow-up, which is about tw uh, two years out, over 93% of patients had improvement. So that's really significant improvement for patients that had you know, chronic pain uh, for several months. Peer Blooms compared PRP to steroid injections. Um, and also found that patients did significantly better with the PRP compared to steroid. 
um, using pain scores about 75%, or whether it was pain scores or the DASH, which is an upper limb functional scale, 75% of the patients were deemed a successful outcome, whereas only 50% of the steroid group got better. Um, you also have to remember there's a large placebo component um, with this. I'm curious what the placebo component is in animals, if there is one, but in humans, an injection could be responsible for 25 to 50% improvement just placebo alone. So Dr. Knapp talked about a series of injections. Filardo um, looked at a series of PRP injections for patellar tendinopathy and found that the series was more effective than single. And there was a statistically significant improvement in pain, function, and satisfaction scores. And in this study, they didn't even use ultrasounds. So you can imagine it would have been better if they did. But this wasn't blinded, randomized, or controlled. Um, and we're running out of time, so I only um, have a couple more slides. One of the treatments I use very often, and often I'll actually use this before PRP, is a PNT, or percutaneous needle tenotomy. It's also known as a fenestration or a barbitage. This is me um, doing this fenestration to a calcified supraspinatus tendon. So this is called the bird's beak view. We're looking at the tendon in long axis. This hyperechoic area is calcification, and I'm repetitively needling that area. Um, there are several studies showing that the PNT alone is effective for tendinopathy. PRP is not covered by insurance, the tenotomy is, so often I'll offer the tenotomy, and patients often tend to do well. If they don't, then I'll offer the tenotomy with the PRP. But whenever I do PRP, I always do it with the tenotomy. Um, so here's an example of a common extensor tendon injection. So I'm short, um, short axis, so the cross-sectional view of the tendon, but then this is called an in-plane image because I can see the needle all along the course. So I advance all the way through the tendon, and then as I retract, I start injecting, and you can see this hyperechoic injectate filling in the gaps I've created. It may not project well, but this subtle area of hypoechogenicity here, here, those are small partial tears. You can see as, a, as I'm retracting the needle, some of that PRP is deposited right into those tears. Um, this is another view of that. So you, it's really important to be facile switching both in and out of plane, short and long axis. So now you're gonna see the needle just as a dot. So now I'm at a plane. This is the tendon footprint here. And so I walk along the tendon to cover superficial and deep. This is proximal, this is distal, this is your radial head, your annular ligament. And what's important is you wanna avoid the radial collateral ligament here. So as I'm injecting, I'm staying superficial to that ligament because you'll create instability if you um, inject that. Again, really important to use ultrasound. You're just not gonna see that or feel that if you're not using guidance. Um, so that's just another example of that saying superficial to the ligament. This is a medial epicondyle or golfer's elbow as we would call it. This tendon is much smaller. It's harder to appreciate, but it's here. And then this patient has a large osteophyte, which I'm gonna try to break up. So here I'm tenotomizing. I tend to do the tenotomy and assuming the patient's tolerating it well, um, then I switch out the syringe and continue tenotomizing as I add the PRP. Um, you know, the, the tenotomy basically creates a substrate like Swiss cheese holes for that PRP to stick to. Otherwise, it may just wash away. And here's just another view of that. So I'm going to, again, switch from the in-plane view to the out of plane view or the short axis view. And you're going to see the needle coming in here as a dot. So now this is the footprint of the medial epicondyle, the common flexor tendon. It's a much shorter tendon and it's usually much thinner. Here, this is very thick because this is abnormal. There's that bone spur, which you're seeing a piece of here. You can see my needle coming in and I'm basically repetitively trying to go with the area of the worst tendinosis that also, of course, correlated with the patient's pain. It doesn't always. Um, so just one more view of that. And again, you're gonna see me add a plane sort of walking along the tendon. So I like to place the needle in plane. I sort of take a mental note of how far I need to advance it. And I place my needle as, as far as I want it to be so that as I'm at a plane and I see the needle just under my transducer, so, so say my transducer is here, I know I'm not going too far. If I park the transducer here, then once my needle passes it, I don't know how far I'm going. You wanna avoid your ulnar nerve, which is right here. So I performed a study where we actually compared the tenotomy alone to the tenotomy plus PRP. I'll spare you all the details. I'll just get to the punchline. Um, so these were the results looking at pain, um, and these were the results looking at sleep and function. There was no difference in the group that got the tenotomy alone or the tenotomy plus the PRP. And we started to notice improvement at around six weeks. So by six weeks, both groups had a, had a significant improvement, but there was no difference between the groups. 
And that's true if you looked at sleep function, medication use, um, and overall, the tenotomy group is actually more satisfied at one year than the PRP group. Now, in this study, this was funded by the Foundation for PM&R. We had a grant. We didn't charge patients. Interestingly, the more you charge patients, the more they think it's going to work. Um, so often when you ask patients if they think PRP is going to work because of the cost involved, there is a bias associated with that that it may work better. But overall, there were very low, there was a very low rate of adverse events. Um, so this study is not showing that PRP doesn't help. It just, in this particular study with the particular PRP I used, there wasn't a significant difference. So in summary, tendinosis is a chronic degenerative condition with a paucity of inflammation. Therefore, using anti-inflammatory treatments doesn't really make a lot of sense. Orthobiologic treatments include PRP, stem cells, or the, just the percutaneous needle tenotomy. Um, the tenotomy alone or PRP alone or the combination have all been shown to be helpful for tendinosis. Um, NSAIDs before and after, as well as the rehabilitation protocols and other patient-specific factors really may affect the PRP results. Um, optimal times, the concentration of PRP, which patients to use it on, how severe the condition is, all of this really needs to be further clarified. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Um, thank you so much for your attention. These are some of my references and we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. I am personally full of questions. The audience also has several questions. Um, I'm just going to ask one question and then I'll let, I don't know if Dr. Knapp has questions for you, Dr. Krishner, and if you have for Dr. Knapp, but one question that came up for me, I, I use PRP regularly, as many of us in sports med uh, do, and I'm curious, a lot of questions actually were about, you know, people actually asked Dr. Can app whether you are stopping and says I know you do, but um, but they're asking for the specifics on that. Uh, I don't know how many in the audience, but I was at a surgery conference. So this was a veterinary sur surgery conference, Dr. Krishner, where Dr. Samuel uh, Franklin, um, I don't know if you know his name, but he does do some translational work. And he presented a paper which was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, so the Human Journal in 2017 where he used the Arthrex PRP product and demonstrated that a COX-2 inhibitor did not affect, um, th did not inhibit any of the growth factors. Um, so I don't know if you were familiar with that paper. It seems, I, I personally do still stop NSAIDs. Um, that was a study that he did on dogs, but I think the purpose of his paper was meant to be translational so that, you know, how much evidence do we have clinically that an NSAID actually does block the effects of PRP in a live patient versus just in a Petri dish? I mean, that's a great question. I don't know if we have good clinical studies to show it makes a difference. I mean, I think most of us don't want to risk our procedure not working. So, you know, how critical is that NSAID to take? Most patients are pretty committed when they're undergoing this procedure. I didn't get into the details of my post-procedure protocol, but often there's a period of non-weight bearing. There's a structured exercise regimen afterward. So there sort of has to be a commitment to the treatment. Um, Celebrex has less antiplatelet effects and less bleeding when we do other procedures too. So it would make sense that that wouldn't have as much of an effect. Um, so the patient had to take and then said, I agree, that's probably the preferred one, but I'd rather than not take it at all. Cool. Sherman, did you want to comment on, there were a few audience members who asked what your protocol is for NSAIDs. Yeah, we follow Dr. Uh, Kirshner's. I, I tell you, I, and I know Sam's paper, I know Sam well, he's a brilliant guy. And um, when the paper came out, I was like, ah, oh, because forever I follow the human literature, which is stop usually a week or two in advance and nothing for two to four weeks after. And um, so we've just followed the same protocol. The question is maybe galopramp because it's a P4 inhibitor versus your typical COX inhibitors. Um, but the reality is, okay, these patients, most of the time, if they're coming to us for PRP, they've already failed standard management. Okay. They've already been on their Rimadils or their Deramexes or their Medicams um, prior to coming in. They've maybe even tried some, some rehab with their NSAIDs. And they're seeing us for a biologic because they're looking for the next the next option. Okay, so for me, I'm going to say, listen, let's take you off for a week in advance. There's gabapentin, there's codeine, there's other things we can use if we need to for pain management because we don't want them to suffer. We want them comfortable, but we have in our you know toolbox other 
pain management uh, modalities and, and meds we can use. And then afterwards, yeah, there can be a flare. You know, if you're using it intraarticularly in our patients, probably 25% of them will flare. It's transient. If you're injecting tendon or ligament or under sedation or anesthesia, maybe dextomator. Um, and again, we'll hit them with some pain management while they're in the clinic and to go home with as well. But within a certain period of time, it should start to have an effect. And if they have to go back on their NSAIDs, then something didn't go right or something's not working in our, in our favor. So I'm not a big fan of NSAIDs during the whole process. There's many of other things that we can reach for. And they're coming to us from far away. They're spending the money on the procedure. You're putting the patient through the procedure. The last thing we want to do is take any risk of hindering the potential outcome because we use the non -steroidal. So for me, I just, we, I and, and all of our VOSM groups around the planet, we just do not use NSAIDs, you know, for a week before and a good two weeks, if not longer after. Challenges even with stem cells. You know, if we're doing BMAC, if we're doing SVF, if we're doing culture expansion, we want pro-inflammatory. We want to upregulate neo neovascularization, angiogenesis, upregulation of cells. Does an NSAID have an effect on that? We know that it affects spinal fusions in humans, has a negative effect there on healing. So for me, not that I dislike NSAIDs, but if I'm doing anything biologic, I'm not using NSAIDs. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I certainly, I never hesitate for the tendinopathies, but I do use PRP to treat OA, and that's those patients that I typically, I just won't hold it quite as long. I'll, I'll do one week before and two weeks after as opposed to going further. Um, another curious question along those lines, uh, when I, I did some rotations at HSS, and it seems, um, tell me if it's different for you, Dr. Krishner, but it seems pretty routine to recommend icing the area, um, so avoiding the NSAID. But would we, I mean, in veterinary medicine, I recommend not icing it at all. So that's what you do too, Dr. Krishner? Okay. I try to tell patients not to ice. There, okay. There's limited research, but some ideas that maybe the, the ice inhibits the release of the PRP uh, exactly. of the granules. So I don't necessarily put a heating pad on it because often this is very painful afterward, um, but I tell them if they can avoid ice, that that would be my preference. Yeah, yeah that's there, interesting. There, I'll, have to, I'll have to remember who the practitioner was, but I was like, oh, we don't recommend icing. So, okay. It just shows that didn't make so sense much, to me. There's so much variability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a recent publication that actually showed that they um, cryotherapy actually deactivates your platelets as well. Yeah. So, um, so we, you know, again, no NSAIDs, no ice, just, just in case. So Dr. Kershaw, I, I don't, I don't I, touch I, them. I, I put the <laughs> biologics in and then you don't touch it. <laughs> I, I have a, I have a question for Dr. Kershaw because I get this asked frequently. I'd love your thoughts on this. Um, photobiomodulation. I don't know if in your hands or in your practice, you're using the different type class three Bs or, or class four lasers, but I'm asked very frequently, can I use light therapy, photobiomodulation, with PRP, and if so, am I using it as a pre-treatment? As I am, I using it post-treatment? Um, what's your thoughts, or, or is this something you, you don't do? Laser therapy, laser, and, and veterinary medicine is so so common. It seems like GP, surgeons, rehab therapists, we all have some degree of photobiomodulation in our toolbox. Um, I don't know if it's the same on the human side, um, and if so, I'd love your thoughts on that with with PRP. We don't use a lot of photo. Um, it's, it's usually not either covered by insurance or it's very expensive to get the machine. Um, there are some studies showing that there's some beneficial effects to it. In humans, cold laser therapy has been shown to be helpful for certain tendinopathies. So you know, we usually try to exhaust all rehabilitation options before going you know, into a biologic. So ideally, the patients have done either you know, phototherapy, laser therapy beforehand. But if they want to use that as an adjunct, I'm totally okay with that you know, after the procedure. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Krishner, I, there was a question from an audience member about what size needle you use for the PNT for your typical adult human. And then uh, somebody asked Sherman if you've tried that technique. So I use a 22 gauge needle. Um, there are surgical tenotomies and those are usually done with either 14 or 16 gauge. Um, but I usually use a 22 and patients tolerate it well. If there's a large calcific deposit, then I may go to something like an 18 gauge. But patients usually, they tolerate better than you would expect. I try to use very little anesthetic. And if I do, I use ropivacaine because it's less tenocytotoxic. And I, I try not to do it at the area where I'm putting PRP, so just subcutaneously. But I start doing the tenotomy. If they tolerate it well, I just keep going. If they don't, I put a tiny bit of ropivacaine, then keep doing the tenotomy, um, and then do the PRP afterward. In the humans, we can't mix PRP or any other drugs together because that's considered creating a new drug. So we just have to switch out the syringe and put in different injectates. 
Yeah, so we we do it. Um, I don't. Deb does. So um, Deb Knapp, the uh, the other ace of SMR here in the practice, um, who's the you know our queen of musculoskeletal ultrasound. She actually learned from from the the guys at Rossum from HSS and uh, with the fenestration technique. So um, very very common. In fact, in in dogs, interestingly, in horses they get these core lesions. So you can place a needle into the lesion in the tendon and inject um, fairly easily. In dogs, if you put a needle, 20, we use 22 gauges, and if you put that directly into the tendon and you try to inject, you're gonna have resistance. You actually physically can eject. So you actually have to, in dogs tendons, use a fenestration technique like you showed and deposit your cells, deposit your PRP as you're, as you're pulling your needle back. And so, um, so yeah, so Deb uses a 22 gauge needle for and uses the fenestration technique as well. Yeah, that's so interesting because we experience the same thing when we are doing the intralesion injections that um, we learned very quickly to always use lure lock because my radiologist was having the PRP like squirt in his face. <laughs> um, but yeah, it seems that you need to penetrate first before you get in. But when I was listening to your technique of the PNT, it sounded similar. I use dry needling for myofascial trigger points and it seems like a similar, you know, you're, you're, you're really almost causing some micro trauma to encourage that neovascularization and, and, um, try to stir up the healing process. So it, it's mm -hmm. really, that's really interesting. Yeah. Let me see what other, uh, I'm just, I'm full of questions, but let me see. And you guys please ask each other, but there are quite a few questions from the audience member, audience members. Um, One of my questions for Dr. Knapp is when you do a series, how, how do you time them? What's the frequency in between? That's a great question. So we rely on how the patient's looking clinically. So what we'll do is we perform an objective gait analysis on every dog. So they walk down a pressure mat and we can see how much pressure they're placing and how their stride length and step length is. And we get videos and we have the owner video of the dog at home as well. So that's our baseline. We'll do our injection. And then two weeks later, we have the owner send in a video where they swing in here. They walk the dog down the mat and we look objectively to see, hey, how are they looking? If there's if they've shown significant improvement, we're like, okay, let's wait. So the soonest we would do it is two weeks. The longest out with the next one would be is four weeks. But again, we're looking because in some cases, if it's a mild tendinopathy, single injection, we're like, wow, we look good. We, we were head bobbing before. Now we're looking good stride length wise. We don't need to booster. her. So we kind of rely on the owner sending us videos because so many of our patients are far away and objective gait analysis to determine do we need a second injection? Okay, if we do, it's that two to four week window, and then we'll get them out another four weeks from there for the final booster. So it's somewhere in there, but we rely on kind of videography, if you would. So telemedicine to see, do they need to come back from New York for that second injection? Or are they looking pretty, pretty good? Um, so that's kind of the window that we follow. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, I was interested, Dr. Kirshner, what you thought about the papers that Dr. Kanat presented on the meta-analysis. They were all single injections. Do you clinically find that repeated injections are more effective than a single? I, I, I'm, I'm just like Sherman where one injection in some patients is enough and in others I need to do repeat injections. So I, I do it just like Sherman. We also use objective gait analysis to help guide us. But more than anything, um, I, I personally use the owner's feedback about how the patient is doing. I, I often just do a single injection and I definitely wait to see the, the full clinical response before thinking about a second um, when we do a second, often patients get good relief, um, but often one injection, you know, works. Um, more is always better, but sometimes one is enough. So, so you disagree with some of those papers then? I'm not disagreeing, but, um, I, you know, maybe it's because I'm doing the tenotomy at the same time. Maybe it's the type of PRP I'm using. Maybe it's because it's people. Maybe there's financial considerations. Um, Maybe for some people, the rehab was was more painful than they would have expected, or the procedure was more painful. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of variables. I'm yeah. definitely not opposed, and I don't disagree with the with the studies. But in my clinical practice, often we find you know one is enough. If I am going to repeat it, I usually wait at least six to eight weeks because that's when we tend to see the full effect of the PRP, and then by then we can really realize that you know, we we can understand if it's helping or not. I tell most patients when I see them back for say a one month follow up. I expect you to be a little worse or the same. If you're better at that point, you're doing great because usually we see the acceleration of recovery after that. So Dr. Kirshner, do you, um, so for us at, at four weeks, eight weeks and 12 weeks, we follow them up with a, a musculoskeletal ultrasound, at least usually by day 45 and 90 is our, our goal, definitely by day 90 after an injection for tendinopathies. Um, how frequently are you using MSK ultrasound as part of your 
rechecks, if you would, to, you know, to gauge response to treatment and progression through the rehab program. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I use ultrasound a lot because it, it's a great teaching tool, you know, really for the patient to show them what's going on and understand their body better um, and look at the pathology. Um, I mean, I've seen that clinical improvement doesn't always correlate with changes in echo texture. And, and there are more advanced ultrasound techniques like elastography, which we're not really using clinically, that can show tendon stiffness that you know a normal ultrasound won't show. Um, so I don't necessarily want to look at the tendon. If it looks worse, the patient feels better than what do I tell them? Um, but I do, you know, I look when it's clinically indicated, you know, I have seen tears heal. I've seen some of these tendinoses look much better afterward. I've seen others where they look similar and the patients still feel better. That's great. Thank you. Let's see. I have a question here. I think it's aimed at Dr. Krishner. Uh, it says, so enjoying this lecture. I was wondering, what do you do for for patients who have obesity as a comorbidity with the tendinopathy, do you recommend weight loss before they begin treatment or do you just recommend concurrent weight loss? Um, I always recommend weight loss. We're always trying to treat, you know, the big picture, um, not just the, the, the joint or tendon we're treating, but again, looking at the kinetic chain, other adjacent joints above and below the whole body. There are some studies that show that patients who exercise before, or this was rats on a treadmill, but when the rats exercise on the treadmill, they have more growth factors and the PRP works better. So for some of my more active patients, even the ones that aren't as active, I try to encourage them to walk, do some exercise beforehand, kind of get the juices flowing, get, get the PRP active. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Knapp? Are you recommending weight loss before PRP? Fortunately, 90% of my patients are these skinny border collie agility, fly ball, dock diving, police dogs. Yeah, so it's it's rare that I, and that's the challenge when I was using adipose derived because I'm like, where am I getting fat from these in these dogs? So I, I don't see as many companions anymore um, that come in like a walking coffee table. Um, if I did, yes, but it's it's challenging. You know, if the owner's sitting there in the exam room feeding them little snossages while you're talking to them about weight loss, you know, if, if it's one of these companions. So, and it's uncomfortable for us as veterinarians to try to talk to an owner about weight loss. We, we, you know, I usually leave it up to my nurses. Here's that handout. I'd like you to go over this with them. Um, but I am so blessed and fortunate that, you know, the majority of my caseload is all these athletic, athletic, and these owners get it. They're coming in, they're athletic as well, many of them. And so if you talk to them about following the regimen, they are really dedicated owners and, and they'll follow it, which just makes our, our job so much more enjoyable because they'll actually listen to us and, and follow, you know, follow the guidance. Yeah. I, um, you know, I live in New York city as Dr. Krishner does. And, uh, uh, my patients are often obese, <laughs> so I definitely, I, uh, I love having the sporting dogs because they're, they're just, you know, beautiful body condition, but I, I personally do also recommend weight loss before doing more invasive, as you said before, I exhaust all other options, of course, weight loss being a major one um, before doing more invasive things. Let's see, there's other questions here. Um, Patrice Mish is asking, comment on prolotherapy versus orthobiologics. I mean, some people think of prolotherapy as almost a first generation or precursor to biologics. Um, and the idea is that similarly, you're creating inflammation to try to stimulate that local tissue response. I personally don't really use a lot of prolotherapy in my practice. Um, the evidence isn't great for it, um, but a lot of clinicians and, and colleagues of mine do use it and get good results from it. Um, but I think we're starting to get more robust data from some of the other biologics like PRP. I, I, I've personally been injected with Prolo <laughs> and PRP and everything else. So interestingly, I've seen dogs that have come in that have had Prolo. Um, and um, here is um, stem cell prolotherapy. I actually wrote an article in, in there that somehow I got asked to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's the whole thing. We're trying to upregulate and shockwave, photobiomodulation, continuous ultrasound, dry needling, you know, what are we doing? We're trying to stimulate the body. And, you know, you inject, you know, dextrose, you know, in this, the cocktail, you're absolutely going to stimulate an inflammatory response. When I had Prolo for one of my issues, it was extremely uncomfortable, but I tell you, I, I had some micro instabilities that were trying to really scar it down and, and cause a stability. Um, it hurt, but I'll tell you when I had PRP, it equally hurt. And so this is my question for Dr. Kirshner, at least on our side, we give general anesthesia, we gave, you know, pain medications. We, you know, our patients are usually out. Of course they wouldn't, if you didn't, they'd probably try to bite us, but you guys are evil. 
you know, on your side, what you may do is you may do a local, which is just as painful as the PRP injection. And so, and then, and then you'll, you'll do this little local, you know, on our skin, like that's, it's the needle going 17 inches deep. But so my question is, yeah, what, do you think the local is really needed? And should you just put that needle in and inject the PRP? Because if we're going to flare, we're still going to flare. But I just wonder from a patient standpoint, you know, because I've had many PRP injections and they all are horribly uncomfortable. Um, would it be worse if we didn't have the local? You know, because again, it's that local is equally, to, in my mind, as painful as when I felt the PRP um, and even the flare later. So is the local to make us psychologically feel better? Or is it truly, do you think, having a, a beneficial effect on us as, as the human patient? I, I feel mean when I don't give local. Um, and believe me, anytime my patient says, ow, I feel bad because my job is to help treat pain, not cause it. Um, but par so part of it is, you know, certainly for patient comfort. I mean, we don't want the local to affect the PRP. So I never put it, you know, in the joint with PRP. I try not to put it in the region of the tendon. But um, I'm always surprised on how well people do tolerate some of these procedures, the tenotomy, the PRP. Often it's like, as I'm finishing up the PRP or even like two minutes later, they're like, oh, wow, it's starting to feel warm and hot. And some of that's the immediate degranulation um, and release of the platelets. Um, but yeah, we need to look at other studies, you know, looking at the anesthetic or not, whether that makes a difference. All my patients are awake, um, but we want them to be as comfortable as possible. Yeah. Uh, let's see, question for both, it says here, do you use uh, T-N-E-X, T-E-N-E-X? What is your experience? I don't, but some of my former students do, and it's basically a larger needle to do a larger tenotomy, um, but there's an ultrasound device associated with it that helps you debride some of the tissue. Yeah, we have not, we've seen it, but we haven't used it either. And a question for Dr. Knapp, what is the volume that you use for injection? Yeah, that's a great question. It depends on the size of the patient and what you're injecting. So let's say we're doing a supraspinatus tendinopathy and it's a grade two and a border collie. Um, you're probably, and we're, again, we do a combination therapy. We found that patient outcome objectively on ultrasound gain analysis and return to function, combination of a cellular therapy, meaning bone marrow drive or adipose drive with PRP gives us the best outcome compared to just PRP. Um, so we're doing a 50-50 mix of the PRP to the other cellular therapy, ultrasound guided, and at the most you're giving like a, a half mil. I mean, it's very small amounts, a mil depending on larger dog and the size of the lesion, um, but they're not huge quantities. And you have to be careful because too much pressure, um, there's studies out there that use saline as a uh, model for causing tendon rupture, you know, so if you have too much pressure on that needle um, and you're injecting even just saline in there, um, you can actually cause deteriorous effects to the tendon. So you have to be very, very careful, you know, and again, these tenotomies, yes, we're releasing fibers, but we don't want to release too many fibers in a tendon that's already releasing. Um, so we have to be careful on pressure and on volume. Um, so about a half mil is, is give or take to a mil, depending on the lesion size that we're injecting. Dr. Krishner, is that is that what the volume that you're using as well in, in tendons? Similar. It depends on the size of the tendon. Um, usually I'm using a sort of a four milliliter aliquot or um, eight to 10 milliliter for my larger um, sort of kits. Uh, the tendons don't hold a lot of the medicine. So a lot of times, yeah, you basically create the PRP, you put between the half and one mil, or maybe it's a very large tendon, two mil. And then you've got the rest of the PRP that you need to put somewhere. So a lot of times it'll, it'll sort of extravasate into the myotendinous junction or out into local muscle tissue or an adjacent bursa. Um, yeah, but not, I agree, definitely not high volume. And you certainly can rupture the tendon. I haven't had anybody rupture from the PNT, um, but if you're injecting you know, into a tendon in large volume, that can definitely rupture it. Um, there were a couple of questions, Dr. Knapp, for you regarding uh, photobiomodulation. I, I think I know what you do, but what are you recommending as far as uh, laser pre or post PRP? Where's my wife? You know, she's <laughs> one that does the ultrasounds and does the, the rehab. I'm like, oh. so, so here's, so with photobiomodulation, you know, these patients are almost all of them, if we had to have them in a rehab program prior to going to orthobiologics, that's our preference. So the majority of the cases we're seeing have already had, um, some sort of they've had shockwave, they've had photobiomodulation, maybe continuous or pulse ultrasound therapy. Um, and so I think I look at that as a pretreatment. You know, you're not hurting any of these tissues or conditions with these types of modalities. I, in my mind, 
you're truly helping them. Um, now we're just helping them further along by adding some sort of biologic to it. And then we're gonna go right back to it. Um, with the PRP, we're waiting and, you know, we're typically waiting for OA. We're going to give them another seven days off of, of laser because, again, what does laser do? It helps with, you know, fluid, you know, lymphatic return, um, decreasing effusion. So what we don't want to do is put a biologic in there and then they use laser to kind of potentially flush it out. Yes, light activates cells, but we want to be careful in the joint. For a tendon or a ligament, it's there. So I feel that, and I believe Deb feels this as well, that shortly thereafter is fine to do photobiomodulation, but then it's a question of class 3B or class 4. Does the heat have a detrimental effect or could that be upregulating? And we know stem cells are definitely heat cold sensitive. So we have to be very, very careful when it comes to heat, you know, whether you're using a, a warm compress or you're using class four laser on the effects of stem cells with, with heat. So, um, so for us, we will use laser. Usually if it's class three B, we'll use it sooner than if it's a class four. Um, for OA, we wait a little bit longer and for tendon ligament, we start sooner. Um, another question uh, for both of you, do you activate or not activate um, before injection? I don't because I'm activating it locally by doing the tenotomy and the platelets naturally activate. And I almost don't want to acceler accelerate the degranulation. The platelets can degranulate for up to two weeks after. And so I don't want them to sort of like throw off all their growth factors at once. I'd rather have that slow release. So about half of the growth factors are released in the first couple hours and then the rest over the next week or two. Um, so I don't activate. Yeah, we, we do not either. We know they activate on 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 contact with the collagen, and and the reality is that those growth factors have an extremely extremely fast half life. Okay, so we want them a slow release, and we don't want them exposed to the environment. You don't want to have activated them. They're sitting there in your syringe, and now you're fumbling around trying to get your ultrasound probe and do your injection. Meanwhile, these little things are saying, "Whoa, what's happening here?" Their half life is they're tanking. So I'd rather have that slow degranulation again use the, the it's not just the site we think about the growth factors and cytokines how about just the platelets and the platelet plug remember it's that scaffold so we we throw if you activate and you're just using your growth factors or cytokines you just threw away a whole nother component of prp that i think is extremely valuable which is the platelet itself which is that that bio scaffold so um so we we've never activated we've always let the body activate for us and have either of you, this is my question, um, because I've heard some institutions uh, will freeze the PRP for future use. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I think the fresher, the better. Or do you both of you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some, you have that owner's ass because it, financially, I mean, this stuff's not, you know, it's expensive. It's expensive for the owner. The kits for us are expensive. And, uh, and so they'll ask, you know, can we do this? But the reality is the literature has shown that, yes, there's still some cytokines of growth factor. And we're not freezing in our freezer next to our Ben and Jerry's. This is minus 70, minus 80. Yeah. And you're still, you know, not many people, you know, you're still limited in, in your um, percentage that are adequate as far as the growth factors in the yeah, cytokines. Yeah, I Take agree. That. Use question. Um, I think I'm just going to ask one final question because we're way over time and I, I appreciate both of you staying on and like we still have like 300 people on so <laughs> clearly everybody is interested Thank but you. um Thank you. Thank you. the question was uh do either of you use hyperbaric oxygen therapy as an adjunct to the oh. biologics I do not I would love to but I don't have one so whoever asked that if they're with a company and they want to donate <laughs> one uh, we we would we have space. Um, no, is, I, I would. It is one of my colleagues, so no, we don't have hyperbaric <laughs> oxygen at AMC either. I know University of Florida has it, and they use it for everything. But um, but yeah, no, we thought about it, but we don't have the space. And yeah, anyway. Yeah, I wish. Um, any final comments from either of you? Thank you so much. This has been incredibly interesting. Uh, we we clearly have. Uh, a very interested audience, and I so appreciate your time, your expertise, uh, the commentary. It's it's been amazing. No, it was it was an honor. And Dr. Kirshner, I, I learned so much from your lecture. Thank you. And uh, it's all again this translational. I could do this all night long. We could just sit here and crack open a bottle of wine, and I could pick his brain. And uh, and uh, yeah, so honored to be here, and Dr. Kirshner, honored to be involved in uh, in this uh, webinar with you. Thanks, me as well, to Dr. Knapp, Alvarez, the whole team at AMC. It's been a great experience. I'm honored to be here. And I'm, if anyone learned anything, I'm really happy about that. So thank you. I learned a lot.
Thank you so much. Um, and uh, tomorrow for um, the audience and anybody else who would like to join us, um, I will actually be speaking along with Jason Makowski from, um, he is a board certified sports dietitian and exercise physiologist. We're gonna be presenting on uh, joint supplements. Awesome. So uh, very hot topic. Uh, so please join us tomorrow for um, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, to listen both the veterinary and human aspect of joint supplements.